This week on the Hollywood and Toto podcast, you might notice something a little different about the show. We explore the new film, The Apprentice, and why you may not see it before Election Day. And we talk to my friend and filmmaker, Joseph Granda. He's got a new movie out. It's called Sasquatch and the Missing Man. And Joseph always has interesting, thought-provoking thoughts about Hollywood, what's going on in the industry. That's why we bring him back to the show so often. It's worth it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. Ever notice that woke celebrities are always preaching their values while insulting yours? And that Hollywood award shows and critics place their narrative before entertainment value, ready to cheer on free expression, even if it means someone's feelings might get hurt? Hollywood and Toto is here for you. Now, here's your host, award-winning film critic and author of Virtue Bombs, How Hollywood Got Woke and Lost Its Soul, A Man With Soul, Christian Toto! If you're listening, I hope you'll like and subscribe to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, again, hit that like button. It does matter. Every bit helps. You may have noticed something a little different about the show this week. Maybe not so for my audio listeners, but yeah, we've gone video. Finally, finally. I've been talking about it for so long. I know my podcasting company has been very, very patient with this transition, but here we are at last, video and audio. And of course, if you're listening on audio, if you've been listening all along, Thank you. I appreciate your loyalty. Not much will change in the audio format. There may be a reference or two of what's going on on screen, but generally speaking, this will just help out people who want to see it in a different format. And about that, <laughs> first of all, no one procrastinates like I do. No one. I am the king. I am the gold medal winner of procrastination. It is my worst feature as an entrepreneur and not a good one, by the way. <laughs> you know, when you get those job interviews and you say, you know, I... I work too much and I, I care too much about the, about the projects I'm working on. No, no, no. Being a procrastinator is terrible. Trust me. I've learned through experience, but here we are at last. And thank you for your patience. If I've been teasing this all along, you've been waiting for this transition. Well, here we are. So what does it mean? It means I got to shave more often. My gosh, I, I had no idea. You know, I work from home. I haven't been in an office and gosh, maybe 15, 16 years. And all of a sudden I have to watch what I wear. I have to shave. I have to comb my hair. I've got to go to the barber more often. It's, <laughs> everything's changing. But you know what? It is change. And of course, why do I have to do that? Because it's the video revolution. YouTube is huge, absolutely huge. And just having an audio podcast right now just isn't enough. I've got to be on more platforms. I've got to explore what I'm doing here. I've got to bring different perspectives. It's all about change. And that brings me to Hollywood because I don't think Hollywood's very good with change. And I don't blame them. Again, change is hard for me. It's hard for everyone. But if Hollywood doesn't change, they're in significant trouble. And listen, every other YouTuber is out there saying that Hollywood is woke and it's dying and it's suffering. And a lot of that is true. Absolutely true. I'm not going to argue with that. But also Hollywood needs to change with the times. And are they doing that? I don't know. I mean, all I see are, well, this project is going to be rebooted and this classic movie is coming back in a brand new format. It's being reimagined. Oh my gosh. I think the, the epic example here is that Chris Hemsworth will now star in a movie that ties the Transformers series with the G.I. Joe series. Oh, great two flailing enterprises that people don't care about as much anymore. They're joining together. How exciting. No, it's not exciting. It's desperation. It's flop sweat time. Listen, I get it. Change is super hard. It's really exhausting, but Hollywood has to innovate moving forward. Now, one of the reasons why I say that is just personal experience. I may have said this before, but you know, when I go to bed at night, I've got my tablet. I'm watching TV, quote unquote TV. How old school? Yeah, <laughs> I'm showing my age just a bit. But what do I watch? Am I watching Netflix? Sometimes. Am I watching broadcast TV? Never, never, never. 
I just actually bought an indoor antenna just so I could watch some sporting <laughs> events. That's it. I don't watch broadcast TV hardly ever. So what am I watching? Well, I'm watching Critical Drinker. I'm watching Film Threat. They have video podcasts. They're entertaining. They're engaging. They're thoughtful. They're different. And you know, the production values are often pretty darn good. I'm watching Sam the Cooking Guy, my favorite video chef. That's what Hollywood has to compete against. All these different platforms, all these different channels, these artists, they don't have million dollar budgets. They don't have huge stars. They are the stars. And yet they compete with the big boys and girls, the studios, the franchises for our attention, for my attention, for your attention. And guess what? <laughs> They're doing okay. They're getting eyeballs. Just look at the subscriber counts. Look at the number of views. It's stunning. You know, I hear major players in the conservative space now, they just reference the critical drinker. He's part of their ecosystem. He's like their Siskel and Ebert. And again, I can't imagine what he puts into these shows. I don't think it's very much. And that's no slight against him. It's just, it doesn't take a lot of money to do what we're doing right now. And for Hollywood, it costs a ton of money and they're losing a ton of money. So here's my message to Hollywood. I could be snarky. I could be mean. And sometimes I will be, you know that. Change, change now, innovate, do something different. Try, fail, fall on your face. That's what the American dream is all about. If you don't do that, if you keep bringing out sequels and reimaginings and all this nonsense, it's not going to work. You're going to be in trouble and tomorrow will not be bright at all. It's what I'm doing here. I'm trying something new. I'm innovating. I'm putting my neck out with this video channel. And yeah, I wish I were 30 years old, but I'm not. But you know what? I'm going to go with it. I'm going to try. I'm going to stick my neck out and I hope you'll join me. The most talked about movie at the Cannes Film Festival was The Apprentice. And no, it's not the old NBC show starring you know who. It's a movie about you know who. Looking at his early days, the 1980s, and how he became an apprentice to Roy Cohen, a pretty despicable fat figure in legal circles. Now, of course, it's a hit piece. I haven't seen it. Would Hollywood do anything else? Have you heard the director's comments about Trump, about fascism? All the usual nonsense that we hear again and again about Trump. It's exhausting, but let's put that aside. The movie may not be seen in theaters before Election Day, which is the whole point. Why would you make an anti-Trump movie now if you don't want to affect the election? But what's going on? Well, Trump is angry at the movie, and you kind of get that. But he has some specific gripes. Notably, there's a scene in the film, and I'm sorry if that's a spoiler alert, but here we go, where he rapes his wife, Ivana Trump. He says it didn't happen. Ivana Trump, before she died, said it didn't happen, but it's in the movie. It's a complicating factor. But the bigger issue here is that Hollywood, the big studios, the small studios, all the people who would be loving to share this particular film with the masses, well, <laughs> they hit the pause button. It's not being distributed yet. There's no one out there who's willing to risk whatever to put this in theaters. Now, this may change. It may change by the time you get this video. I doubt it. But why? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of fear here. I think fear the legal situation. I get that for sure. Although you could, you can kind of nip and tuck the movie and take out some of those problematic scenes. And I think everything else would be perfectly fine. But also it turns out that Hollywood doesn't want to alienate its audience. Suddenly, miraculously, Hollywood is realizing that if you alienate half the country, you may not sell as many tickets. You may cause a problem with the studio, with the brand in question. <laughs> wow. Isn't that what I've been talking about for maybe years and years now? It's surreal. I actually read this in either Variety or The Hollywood Reporter, something exactly like that. They don't want to alienate audiences. Well, what changed? They've been eager to alienate audiences for so, so long. It's all they've done for the past maybe decade, maybe more. Well, money changed. As I said before in the show, Hollywood is in trouble. Reality shows are, are dwindling. Uh, the post-strike Hollywood ecosystem is in turmoil. AI has them scared to death, and I don't blame them. Uh, 
The box office is down, down, down and not looking good for the summer. You've got all these different complicated factors. So Hollywood can't afford to insult us anymore. It can't afford to alienate us. They could before, at least they thought so. But you know what? What's ironic, ironic about this is that they never should have thought this way. They never should have insulted us. Listen, they could have put left-wing projects out there. God bless them. If it's successful, go for it. But it was the messaging. It was the branding. It was the award show after award show where they insulted you and me <laughs> again and again. Now, they've slowed that role, obviously. Have you seen the last few award shows? Much less political, much less insulting, and more unifying. Well, good for them, but oh, maybe it's too late. So now The Apprentice is in trouble. We don't know if we're going to see it. I guess we'll see it at some point. Maybe someone will rally. Someone will stick their neck out and say, hey, let's give this a try. It is an election year. What better time to put it out there? Let the people decide if they want to see it or not. Well, that's fine. But isn't it interesting that all of a sudden Hollywood cares what we think? <laughs> it's not organic. It's not authentic. It's not real. It's reality. The numbers, they're not on Hollywood's side. And that means The Apprentice may never see the light of day. We'll have to wait and see. There's a few good reasons why Joseph Granda is back on the show. First of all, he does the announcement. So I love having him back in the show for that reason alone. Plus, he's a friend, full, full disclosure. He's not just a guest on this show. I hang out with him. I chat with him. We text back and forth. I've known him for years. He's a good guy, a smart guy, and a funny guy. Very funny. Also, he's an interesting person. He was in the belly of the beast. He was a Hollywood actor in the 90s. He wasn't super successful, but he was a working actor. And then he got burned out and he left. And he thought, well, that part of my life is over. I'll move to Colorado. I'll start a family. I'll try something new. But, you know, he's an artist at his heart and he couldn't let go. And good for that. A couple of years ago, we made a film called The Healing Garden. It was a faith-based movie, but it had a bit of an edge to it, a little dirt underneath the surface. I liked it. I think you will, too. Check it out. It's on a lot of the stream, different streaming platforms. Now he's back behind the camera. He's working on the Sasquologist, which will be coming in the, in the few months. It's a really interesting story. I don't want to give too much away about it, but I have seen a rough cut and a not so rough cut, and it's quite good. But right now, let's talk about his current project. It's all called Sasquatch and the Missing Man. It's a documentary that talks to several people who have seen the big guy up close. Believe it? Don't believe it? Well, their stories are fascinating. And it's almost a subculture of people who have seen something that no one else believes. How do they cling to those beliefs? Why do they cling to those beliefs? What about their memories? How do they, how do they process what they've seen? It, it's all fascinating. Works on many different levels. I think if you're a Sasquatch buff, you'll enjoy it. If you're not, I think you'll be intrigued as well. You also love what Joseph has to say about Hollywood and the, the bigger picture here. Again, he's someone who's been in the industry. He's watched it as it's grown, as it's shrunk, as it's changed. I think it has to change some more, as I said earlier in the show. Let's hear what Joseph has to say about his new film, his upcoming project, and Hollywood in Toto. <laughs> it was terrible. I'm sorry. Well, as Alyssa Milano says, sorry, not sorry. Here's Joseph. Well, Joseph, thanks for joining the show in our new video format. And uh, you and I have known each other for a while. No secret there. But uh, you've been busy. You had a traditional Hollywood career. You've segued into the independent realm in more ways than one. But you have a new film, Sasquatch and the Missing Man. Talk about that, the origin of it. And, and I, I know Sasquatch, Bigfoot, has a, has a strong appeal for you as a creator. So we'll maybe kind of start with the film and, and segue into that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, Sasquatch and the Missing Man is the um, is uh, one of th three documentary style films that I did with uh, Tony Merkel of the Confessionals podcast and Merkel Media. And what I've done uh, for them is I've come in as a producer on those movies, mm -hmm. and and I think there's a real future in this. Is we've taken 
some of their best podcast episodes and gone out and turned those into mm -hmm. documentary films based on the person telling their, you know, paranormal story. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a real future in that in um in uh, pod filming as i'm calling it um because you know you need to you need to continue to evolve your podcast into a into wider audiences and visual formats and so you know i'm also in the in talks with working with some other big podcasters to do that with them too because it can be done um relatively inexpensive and um all the movies the the the, the way we roll them out <clears throat> All the films, well, the two that we've I've released with them that were documentaries um, <clears throat> have both made their money back and then some. In fact, the last one that we did, Sasquatch and the Missing Man, uh, made half of its budget back on the night of the premiere, the VIP premiere, uh, through uh, Moment.co, which is a company owned by um, Patreon. Gotcha. Um, well, that's more than Furiosa can say because they're, they're not making their money back. Oh, really? Um, it, unless it, it has bomb? legs. But, uh, well, you know, it's funny. I, I've seen the film. And one of the things that struck me is, listen, you can enjoy it on a certain level. But it's also a character study of these people who have views that are not embraced by the mainstream or they're, they're, they've are they lived through something extraordinary. And I, I found that as as fascinating as the sort of the, the themes of the film itself. It, it, as a storyteller, what, what's your take on that part of the film? I didn't see Furiosa yet, but um, I I saw the trailers. It looks like they're using a lot of CGI, which they didn't in the last one. Yeah, good point. Good point. You know, which makes it which. So I mean, just on the topic of of so Sasquatch and the Missing Man is going to be released um, in about two weeks. I think June fourth, possibly. Mm -hmm. You can watch it at MerkleFilms dot com. And what it was is is so there's a guy named Wes Germer who has the largest. Sasquatch podcast in the world. He's got hundreds of thousands of downloads every every week. Mm -hmm. And so we went and retold his story um out in the middle of nowhere. And we spent two nights out in the middle of nowhere. And listen, I'm not a real believer in it, uh, and other than its lore and its legend. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I had some some unexplainable experiences that you can see on the film. Um and we found we found a, a, a car there, abandoned car that um, we reported. And you know, a year later, as we're about to release this film, the sheriff department got a hold of us and said they found um, a, a skull and and remains of a man. And we're still waiting for the DNA test, but oh they suspect that it's this guy, even though they had gone out searching for him a week after we reported it. Mm -hmm in like a five mile radius, didn't find anything. A mountain biker found this body. So mm -hmm. hence Sasquatch and, and the missing man. Um, but, you know, then after that, I went and I wrote, directed and starred in this film called The Sasquologist. And one of the things that I wanted to do, we, you know, mentioning the overuse of CGI is I really wanted to get back to the roots of the 1990s independent film spirit and making. And so I used a very small crew mm -hmm. um, in, in the effects, we didn't use any effects unless it could be used in the 1990s. So it really kind of, and I know you've seen the film, it has that feel of a real independent um, feel to it. Yeah, it has a one person wrote this story feel, which I love. And by the way, even though it has a 90s sensibility, I think aesthetically it feels like a movie that was made now because it doesn't look cheap. It doesn't look like an independent movie with all the with all the, the 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 rough edges around it, it looks good, which is uh, obviously a test. Yeah, no, I mean we skills. used all the modern technology when it comes to film and sound, yeah. but when it came to like portals lighting up or Bigfoot uh -huh. eyes that are red, mm -hmm. we used practical devices rather than yeah. plugins for. I think that gave that lends to a certain charm that I wanted the movie to have. Yeah. You mentioned before that you're making your money back on these projects, which sounds simple, but Hollywood doesn't seem to be able to uh, get that message. If you were talking to a studio executive and you kind of shared your model, obviously an independent model, obviously a much smaller scale, but what's what's the secret here? I mean, it seems like that should be job number one to make sure you you know you cover you cover your expenses and you're doing that on a small level. But 
Why can't Hollywood learn that lesson? It seems like an important one to, to glean. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that you have to do, I can only speak as being an independent filmmaker, is mm -hmm. is I, when I sit down to write a movie that I think I have the opportunity to actually make, I have to say, who is this for? Mm -hmm. You know, a, along with having it universal themes in its narrative, but who is this for? Who am I going to aim it at first? So I'm writing to a specific audience mm -hmm. because the market is so saturated and what Hollywood, I don't think, listen, I don't know. I, I don't think they get is that they could make $25 million budgeted movies and make 50, $65 million back, mm -hmm. but they're not interested in that because I think there's a, a huge sort of like tent pole ego vibe to all of it. They want to spend $300 million, Brad Pitt racing car movie that they're working on <laughs> in the hopes of making 700 million. And that's very rare. And, and I don't think they understand the bifurcation of, of media and, you know, I mean, and lots of people, less and less people I think are going to the theaters. Yeah. I could be wrong. You know, um, I remember talking to my DP on this, on the feature film that I wrote, directed and played lead in the Sasquologist. I was talking about, we were talking about camera and 4k and 8k. And he goes, listen, if the camera's all 4k, we're shooting 4k, but people are going to watch this on 1080p because <laughs> <laughs> they're going to watch it on their, on their laptops or on their phones. Yeah, which is just you have to move with the techno technological times or you're, you're just going to get left behind. Mm -hmm. Again, these seems like simple common sense approaches that Hollywood often doesn't embrace. Um, you, you talk about sort of knowing your audience. Now, I, I think the fact that you're making these projects sometimes based on a podcast episode, you know, we're seeing more of that now. It used to be based on a popular book. Now it's based on a popular podcast, but it's that source material that does have a bit of heft to it where you have a built-in audience. And for me, I can't blame Hollywood when they do the sequels and prequels and reboots because there's a similar thinking there. What, what are your, is, do we have a shorter shelf life now on, on that kind of thinking or is it maybe just kind of being based on different source material now where it might be a video game, might be a podcast? Yeah, I, I, I just think they're, uh, the, the people who are in charge of Hollywood are not filmmakers. Mm -hmm. You know, um, their idea people, their number crunchers. And I think I think they can they're more comfortable with relying on remakes because mm -hmm. they can say, well, it worked back then. You know, we don't know what happened. Yeah. Um, but again, I think that they could make. Much uh, smaller budget movies and make their money back and tell good yeah. stories. And. But, you know, it's it's I just think it's greed also. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I was just talking to a colleague about this particular subject where we're hearing that more and more established veteran filmmakers, people we love and respect to a degree, Catherine Bigelow, uh, John Waters, uh, John Sales, and they all have the same story. They can't get their new stories made. You know, you worked in the 90s in Hollywood in the belly of the beast. You're doing it outside the system now. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, even a Scorsese, he's got to go to Netflix to get the cash to make a, an Irishman. Why? Why are these old school filmmakers who have a track record and have legitimate talent? Why can't they get their stories made? Because they're old, <laughs> and, and Hollywood is run by new, younger people, and they uh, look at them as old. And what do they know? Even though these are the most, these are the people who, you know, in the seventies, made what Hollywood is today. A, you know, a vibrant film industry, yeah. and I just think there's there's a, a huge disconnect between the old, and then I don't know, is John Waters asking for, for $50 million to make a, uh, who knows what? I mean, I, I can't imagine John, John Waters or Catherine Bigelow can't make a little story and get five to $10 million to make it. Somebody gave these guys millions, a couple of million dollars, I would guess at least to make the, these Jesse Eisenberg walking around in a, Sasquatch outfit, which was, I, I didn't make it through the whole movie. It was, you know, a me who, who is steeped in the understanding of the sort of Sasquatch world, yeah, yeah. The, the research I've done, I, I thought it was a missed opportunity for my audience, which is what I've point, been pointing the, these movies at is people, people love Bigfoot. Everybody has a Bigfoot sticker or a <laughs> hat or, or whatnot. But my film, the Sasquatchist is a much deeper, Thing. It's sort of like, you know, I went in writing and I went and um, 
I talked with guys who are very serious about looking for this thing. And one of the things we had in common with some of them is that we both sort of lost our fathers as young men. And I asked one of them, I said, do you ever think that really you're out here just looking for your old man? And he thought, oh, my God, oh crap, I never thought of that. Yeah. And so that's kind of what the story of the Sasquologist is about. It's about a, uh, a seasoned Sasquologist hunter who believes he's tracked the same Bigfoot mm -hmm. from Washington to Colorado. And he reluctantly takes a young man with him to learn the ways of squatching, as they call it. And um, what they both discover is that they're really looking for something. Some, they're looking for a childhood they, they didn't have, not, yeah. not just a hairy beast. But, well, we're going to have you on the show again later when that movie comes out. I can't wait. I've seen a, I've seen a couple of rough and a pretty fine cut. I, I, I can't wait to talk more about it, but I want to do that closer yeah. to the release date. But uh, Joseph, before we let you go, you know, you have such a unique perspective on Hollywood. Uh, you're not beholden to it. You've been in it. Uh, and now you can watch it from afar with a, a unique perspective. But what's... What are we not talking about when we talk about Hollywood? You know, we could talk about the grosses being down. We could talk about there's no stars that really open a film these days. We could talk about streaming really struggling and they're trying to try to change the revenue stream and the, the rise of things like YouTube where, you know, you can watch really amazing programs at a fraction of the cost. But is there anything else you think that's out there in the, in the zeitgeist that you're noticing that maybe we'll be talking about in a year, but you're kind of seeing it now? Uh, I think Hollywood is still... Um afraid of being truthful i think um that's a heavy statement by the way yeah i mean i don't disagree I don't, it's just a heavy i don't statement. think that those people actually believe some of the things and the movies that they're saying listen mm -hmm. <laughs> tell me the last time you didn't see a multicultural mixed race person couple on a commercial that's <laughs> just cannot. disingenuous yeah it's it's just disingenuous and people of color mm -hmm. see that mega it's just pandering it's you know it's it's mm -hmm. it's the aesthetic doesn't match the reality and i think they're afraid of mm -hmm. of being on I, I they're also afraid of of going listen if, if somebody if some of those some of those people uh in the show business world said listen we're just going to make a couple movies aimed at the maga crowd Let's see what happens. Yeah. What do you think would happen? Ka-ching. That's what would happen. ka So, you know, what's that's the other thing that's really changed about Hollywood. It used to be about making money. But their ideology, and listen, that's fine. If you want to put your ideology in front of your dollar, go for it. Yeah. I don't recommend it. You know, I have my own politics and thoughts, and I don't, I don't put that into my movies. I just want to entertain people. That's why I think... Tom Cruise is really the key to what Hollywood should be, in my opinion. He just wants to entertain people. Mm -hmm. I don't care what he prays to or where he votes. I don't know. I know some of it, obviously. Mm -hmm. But he just wants to entertain people. And, and I think he's very genuine in, in that. He just wants people yeah. to have fun. You, you mentioned truth. And I think it's a great note to sign off on because why is Joe Rogan so successful? Because he has honest, raw conversations. He doesn't even have set in stone views he kind of goes here he goes there he bases it on the conversation on what he's absorbing but i think one of the reasons why podcasting has been so successful is because it feels authentic and it yeah. feels like something that's different from the mainstream and in our in our attention deficit age we'll stick around with joe rogan for three hours to hear a conversation where we don't know where it's going next and i think that's why some of the youtubers are so successful uh the critical drinker for one example and uh yeah. but you know when we have storytellers like you who are doing things that are authentic and real and genuine and on a smaller scale but knowing their audience as well gee i think they may connect and i i can't wait to talk more about the sasquologist but for now it's a uh, sasquatch and the missing man is available you said june 4th i believe yeah, uh, i think they're gonna it's gonna release june 4th at merkelfilms.com Excellent. Um, you can go and see a trailer there right now for it. And uh, if you want to see my stuff, you can go to josephgranda.com, josephgranda.com. And actually, there's a film there that I did for a Bitcoin company out of uh, New York City, about a little town in Texas. It's free. You can click it on. It's called The Big Empty. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know much about Bitcoin, you'll learn about it. And you actually see what the inside of a, a Bitcoin mining plant looks like. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. 
Well, it's been fun for me knowing you and watching this particular journey of yours. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's different. And I'm learning a lot about Hollywood and what, what to do. And of course, what not to do, which I think the industry knows a little bit all too well, but uh, Joseph, thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks for being a part of it. And uh, again, we will talk soon. Yeah, my pleasure. That's it for the show this week. Thank you to Radio America having me as part of their great podcast lineup. And of course, if you have a chance, check out HollywoodInToto.com. This is its 10-year anniversary. It is, like this show, the right take on entertainment. No woke, just smart commentary, unusual think pieces, and stories you're not going to find anywhere. That matters. Hollywood Entertainment Press, they love to ignore stories. I don't we don't at hollywoodintoto.com. So do check it out. And of course, like and subscribe to this show as well. I will see you next time. And thank you for being part of this bold and a little scary experiment into the video universe.